Welcome everyone and good morning. Welcome to this party to this session on state aid in the context of the just transition mechanism. My name is Juliette Delarue. I'm a senior lawyer and state aid lead at Client Earth. Client Earth is an environmental NGO work using the power of the law to protect the environment. We are working on the alignment of the state aid framework with the Green Deal and just transition objectives and I'm very honored to moderate the session today. Today's session is very timely. Member states are in the process of drafting their territorial just transition plans, delivering on the objective of carbon neutrality and accompanying a just and green transition will require significant investments and targeted support. Regions will need to have a clear understanding on how the Commission, in particular DG Competition, will assess the plan spending under stated rules. But why is state aid and DG competition's role in irrelevant here, besides the role of DG Rejo in assessing the plans? Well, you may know that under Article 107 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, financial advantages given by member states to companies such as grants, loans, guarantees, tax rebates, investment aid may qualify as state aid. Member states have a large discretion on how they're going to spend the just transition funds or the invest EU funds, um, as they will explain in the territorial just transition plans. But because those funds are not managed only by the EU, but ultimately by the member states themselves, they fall under state aid control. The rule is that state aid can be authorized by the Commission after a case by case assessment, or it's exempted from notification to the Commission if the member states define the state aid within the context of the general block exemption regulation. In the context of the just transition mechanism, the Commission will assess the planned state aid under the basis of different guidelines and the ones which are relevant for our discussion today are the regional aid guidelines and the guidelines for climate, environmental protection and energy or the wise called the CEAG. Our speakers will explain why these guidelines have just been revised to facilitate the grant of aid in accordance with the just transition objectives. They will also explain how the guidelines interact with each other and when it's possible uh, to combine or to differentiate regional aid and energy and environmental protection aid. So let me introduce our speakers. We have the honor today of uh, hearing from Catherine de Marais and Alejandro Donay from DG Competition. First, Catherine de Marais will speak about the regional aid guidelines. She's a deputy head of unit at DG Competition, dealing with state aid in the regions, in regional aid and infrastructure. She qualified in applied economics in Belgium and has been working for several years in the private sector, including at Belgian Post and Brussels Airport uh, Company, as well as at PricewaterhouseCooper, where she used to be a location consultant, providing location and visitor services to large multinationals. Secondly, Alejandro Donay uh, will speak about the CEAG. He's a deputy head of unit at DG Competition dealing with state aid in the energy sector. He's also uh, graduated from economics and business administration as well as in law and has been working for DG Competition for the past eight years in the field of energy and financial uh, sector. He also used to work in the private sector in investment banking. We also joined today by Sander Hapars from DG Rejo who is here to also assist you if you have any questions on the Just Transition uh, Fund and the plans um, in the Q&A later on. Please type your questions in the Q&A and we will pick them up after the presentation. Um, without further ado, um, Catherine de Marais will start by explaining you the regional aid guidelines um, and their relevance in the context of the Just Transition mechanism. Thank you, Juliette. Um, so indeed, I will uh, talk about regional aid. Um, so maybe if you could go to uh, slide number four. So um, first of all, it's important to understand what is regional aid. So I would say that this main characteristic, characteristic is that it concerns aid that is aimed at regional development. So the aim is important. So where the money comes from is in this respect not important. So this could be state money, regional money, money coming from the EU. So it's not on this basis that we qualify um, regional aid. So regional aid is typically aid to productive investments. So for example, aid to set up a manufacturing plant of whatever, a large automotive company, for example. 
So it's not um, so not all aid, however, to productive plants is regional aid because it could also have an environmental objective, for example, or could be an investment in R&D. This would not fall under the uh, heading of regional aid. So in the next couple of minutes, I will talk about where aid can be granted. So where in Europe and also to what type of projects and I will highlight, but very briefly, some of the key compatibility principles, which are already highlighted uh, on the slide, just very briefly. But it is in this sense important to know that, um, as Juliette already mentioned, but also regional aid can be granted both under the general block exemption regulation, where there is a chapter on regional aid, or it can be notified to the Commission for uh, assessments under the guidelines. So uh, in the next slide, so where can aid now be granted? So there we see a, we see a map. It's not the most uh, actual one. Uh, you see a difference in color. This reflects um, so the, the regions that are not colored or the so-called non-assisted areas. So there the, the, the difference is highlighted between non-assisted areas and assisted areas. So a certain region uh, or an area must be assisted and defined as such on a regional aid map to have the possibility to grant regional aid. And uh, on average, about half of the of the EU territory is an assisted area. The map here is not is just a, the picture is not fully accurate. It's not that the uh, full of France, for example, is assisted. It's just that uh, we need some granularity to uh, to draw maps uh, visually. Um, but as you know, in April this year, we adopted the new regional aid guidelines. Um, and in fact, the regional aid maps or a part of the uh, regional aid guidelines. Those has, have not all been adopted yet, but we are currently in the process, member state by member state, to adopt uh, a new regional aid map that will be applicable for the period 2022-2027. Uh, uh, for example, some maps that are already adopted and are public or Hungary, Czech Republic, for example. Um, if you could then go to the next slide, I will explain the difference between the so-called A and uh, C areas. So A areas are the poorest areas. They have a GDP, so gross domestic product, uh, lower than 75% of the EU average. Also outermost regions are uh, defined as, uh, as A areas. So those A areas are already listed in the annex to the guidelines. So you can already consult them, uh, they are there. For the assignment of so-called C areas then, which is like an in-between area, it's, it's still assisted, but it's not as poor as the A area. And for the assignment of those areas, there is a wider range of criteria. So we have C areas that all are already predefined in the annex to the guidelines. Those are, for example, areas that had an A status in the previous period. There we say, okay, if there was an A status in the previous period, uh, we do not want this area not to be assisted anymore in the next period, for example, because it has seen a positive economic development, but we allow for like an intermediate uh, status, which is the so-called predefined C status. Also, for example, sparsely populated areas are predefined in the guidelines. Um, and then there are the so-called free C areas or the non-predefined C areas. And those areas are proposed by the member states. So based on specific criteria. So that's why also in our process, member states have to notify to the commission a proposal for a regional aid map, which is then assessed by the commission and on which a, um, a decision must be taken. So, um, so how how, man, how many areas and how can member states um, assign such free C areas? Well, the annex to the guidelines defines how much coverage each member state has to assign such areas. So, for some member states, this is a uh, this is a large a large number because, for example, they do not have any A areas. Other member states do not have any C coverage anymore. 
or because they are all covered by a areas or because maybe it's a very a very rich country who has a very high gdp uh compared to to other areas of europe so it's it's really a, a member state by member state uh, assessment so when it comes now well probably most interesting to you to the um areas defined in the territorial just transition plans so the gtf territories as, as we call them um so indeed those plans still have to be adopted so how does it work now um with the maps well it is important to know that many of those territories that might be assigned uh, well anytime soon I for this uh, for this uh, I would have to um, consult Sander to see what is the timing of those um, but many of those areas might already be part of a areas or C areas on the basis of other parameters as just mentioned so so how um, what parameters can a member state use to assign um, an a uh, C area on the map. This can be socioeconomic criteria, can also be geographical criteria, can be because a member state um, is, is a border area, can be because, uh, sorry, um, not a member state, a region is a border area, can be because of structural problems uh, in that area compared to the national level. So there are all kinds of uh, criteria and it may therefore be that GTF territories are already part of an assisted area. However, for the territories that are not assigned yet, then the member state has the possibility to assign such areas quite easily on the map. Um, I know that maps, so the, the, the regional aid maps for state aid purposes, we are in the process of adopting them now and there are, well, in, in many cases, many cases attention because the, the GTF uh, or the territorial just transition plan has not been adopted yet. Well, in the guidelines, we allow for the possibility to amend the regional aid map afterwards once those territories are uh, are known and are listed. Therefore, the member state has to keep like a, has to keep like a reserve to to assign such areas um, in the future. Um, if we go to the next slide, maybe very briefly on the maximum aid intensities. Well, each area in the regional aid map is besides the status as A area or C area is also assigned a certain maximum aid intensity. As you can see in the table, those can range from about 10% to about 50% standard aid intensity for large enterprises. In addition, some bonuses apply to medium sized enterprises and to small firms um, and also for other bonuses apply. For example, for GTF territories that are located in A areas, we have also uh, a bonus um, and, and maximum aid intensity that can uh, be applied. So it would be a bonus of about uh, 10%, but still it's always the member state that has to propose to use this possibility. So it's not because this possibility exists that for all such territories, the maximum aid intensity must be uh, in the map and must be um, applied. So just in relation to the maximum aid intensities, just to note that for um, large investment projects, we also have in our rules a kind of scaling down mechanism, we call it. So this means that the maximum aid intensity cannot be linearly applied to the full investment amount, but the bigger the investment is, the we scale down, let's say, the, the, higher, the higher parts of the, uh, of the investment. When we go down to uh, slide number eight, um, we have seen now up to now where can aid be granted, how much regional aid can be granted, but what is also crucial is to see to which projects um, regional aid can be granted. And there we, um, uh, well, so, so re, there we use the, the we, we have certain, certain principles and there are differences between a regions and C regions and between uh, SMEs and large companies. As you can see in the, well, the, the two colors, the yellow color and the blue color, basically um, in A areas, both for large enterprises and for SMEs, there the rules are the same and the rules um, 
in, that apply in air areas also apply to SMEs and, and C areas. So that's that's more or less uh, one group of, of projects. And then we have the other group, uh, which are the large enterprises in the C areas where uh, we do not have that much flexibility as for the A areas and as for the SMEs. Um, and, and there is a reason for that. So it's um, because regional aid to large enterprises um, for their investments in, in the C areas is unlikely to have uh, an incentive effect. So that's why in C areas, regional aid is only allowed for setting up of new establishments, so like a greenfield investment, a new factory, or for the diversification into new economic activities. If so, if a, if a, if a plant really starts to, to uh, produce something completely different, then we can also say that, okay, you can see it as if it were a new uh, plant, let's say. Um, so those are the only types of investments that can be um, supported in C areas. When we look at A areas and for SMEs, there we allow also regional aid to expansion investments or to fundamental change projects in the uh, in existing plants, let's say. However, and there um, there is the exception for uh, just transition territories. So in those territories, because they are well most affected by the, the climate um, transition, there we, we consider that the structural advantages normally available to, to large enterprises, so they're, they're because of being a large enterprise, that this might not be sufficient to, well, first of all, to reach the level of investment, which is vital to ensure a balanced socioeconomic transition and to offer sufficient employment opportunities to um, offset other job losses stemming, for example, from the closure of economic activities well, that are linked with, uh, with the transition. So therefore, that's the reason we have a specific derogation for um, GTF areas, but only if um, certain conditions are fulfilled. So it would not be in all C areas, so only the, the poorer C areas. Um, the investment and the beneficiary must be identified already in the territorial just transition uh, plan. And then the, um, the state aid for the investment must be covered by the GTF funds to um, the maximum allowed. So those are specific conditions, but as you see, there is the derogation um, for in, so specifically for the just uh, transition territories. Um, so this is more or less where aid can be granted um, and to which projects aid can be granted. So, and then just very briefly and um, to conclude, if you could go to the next slide on the um, common principles. So meaning the compatibility principles. Well, there it's, um, Again, important to, to distinguish between the general block exemption regulation and the guidelines. Because um, the bulk of regional aids is currently granted under the general block exemption regulation. So for aid amounts up to certain notification thresholds and there the analysis is less demanding and there is no intervention needed from uh, the commission. However, in potentially problematic cases or very big cases, um, those cases need to be notified and are then assessed um, by the Commission after, after notification. For, so, for example, what needs to be notified, it could be a case where there is a relocation. So, where another plant at another location is closed and then it is moved. So, it's important that no state aid is used, for example, to trigger relocations from one member state to the other, which is uh, quite obvious, I would say. Um, and then the other common principles, but I will not spend time um, on it here, just because uh, we, we don't have that, that time to go in detail. Um, but just to, to highlight that um, aid must always have like incentive effect. It must be an appropriate instrument. So granting the aid should be the, the best thing to do, let's say, after exploring other alternatives. Uh, the aid must be proportionate, so the aid amount uh, should be limited to the minimum necessary and the aid should have 
no undue negative effect. So another example besides relocation of such undue negative effects would be if, for example, um, there is like a, a subsidy war and aid is and sorry and and uh, projects or by giving aid or steal let's say from uh, from other regions also if um overcapacity would be created uh in a certain sector this would also be uh, an undue negative effect and then there would be a no go for the aid but again, as said, um, well, and to conclude, most of the regional aid is granted under the general block exemption regulation. Most of uh, member state, states have specific schemes to make the granting of that aid um, relatively easy, let's say. So that was just in a nutshell, what is a regional aid? Because I could go on for uh, some more hours, um, but I will leave it here uh, and I give the floor back to uh, Juliette. Thank you very much for this very uh, complete presentation. Maybe just one question before we go to the presentation on, on the SEAG. So you mentioned already that for state aid, for large enterprises, there are specific conditions into the regional aid guidelines for the sea areas. Can you just recall the audience? Why DG competition in state aid guidelines can, let's say, add these requirements that the investments and the projects are identified in the territorial just transition plans um, because I don't think it's a requirement in the Just Transition Fund regulation. Um, and how it's going to help you to assess the compatibility of the aid with the internal market in that context? Um, well, again, it's it's important to um, to make this the distinction between A areas and, and C areas, because for A areas, we do not require that those projects are already identified in the plan. So there, there is much more flexibility. Um, for C areas, well, as said, um, normally we consider that state aid to large companies for their existing activities has no incentive effect because they just have the advantage of already being there, of, of having established contacts with the authorities, of, yeah, of being established in the area, let's say. Um, however, so it's, it's, it's precisely because uh, of this um, exception and this exceptional derogation for the just transition areas that we require um, that this is already identified in the just transition plan to keep it really the exception rather than uh, the rule. So that's the that, that's the basic idea um, behind it. Thank you very much. Um, maybe Alejandro, uh, then I, um, you can now present us about the stated guidelines for climate and environmental protection and energy, and we'll take the questions um, of the audience at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet, and good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for these presentations. Um, today, I, I want to present you the, the guidelines on state aid for climate, environmental protection and energy. That is the, the evolution of the current guidelines on, on energy and, and environment protection. Uh, that, as you probably know, the Commission is currently reviewing with the intention to adopt them before the end of this year. So if we can go to, to the next slide. Um, as you know, uh, the, the current guidelines, the AAC, were, were adopted in 2014 and they have already established or provided a, a very good framework for, for member states to, to provide uh, support and aid in areas related to, to the Green Deal. No, they have helped significantly the evolution of uh, renewables energy in the last few years, uh, other means of decarbonization as well, but also in circularity, zero pollution. So. We did a, a fitness check, which is an evaluation of the guidelines uh, in 2019. And this evaluation showed that uh, the guidelines indeed, and, and also the section seven of the general block exception regulation, which is the one related to environmental protection, that these rules have supported achieving the, the climate targets. But uh, we need to review them. And why? Because the challenge now is huge. I mean, both the Green Deal, but also the, the recovery, after the, the COVID crisis is a huge challenge for the European Union and we need uh, new rules that are fully up uh, to the challenge uh, and therefore that's why we are reviewing them. So in the next slide, 
you can see uh, very briefly the, the timetable or the timeline of this revision. We had a, a eight week consultation uh, on the basis of our questionnaire that we carried out in autumn last year. Then we published a, a support study in June this year and also uh, the, the consultation of the draft text of, of the new guidelines that already took place in June, July. Uh, in mid-July, we had a, a multilateral meeting already with member states where they were presented with these uh, draft guidelines and they provided comments. And as I said, the objective is to have them uh, adopted uh, just before the end of this year. So in the next, uh, let's say, four to six weeks. Um, and as you can imagine, then we are in the in the final process. In the next slide, you can see uh, that this revision has attracted a huge interest from all type of stakeholders. Uh, in this consultation that we carried out in June, July this year, we got almost 740 contributions from businesses, associations, NGOs, but obviously also from all the member states and, and, and citizens. And the most commented sections were the ones on, on support for energy intensive uses, but more importantly also the one on reduction on greenhouse gas emissions and also the, the horizontal section. Now you can see, but you can see in, in the chart uh, below, in the chart with the columns, uh, the different areas uh, that are covered by these guidelines that as you will see, try to address practically all the areas uh, of, the, of the green deal and of the green transition. So in the next um, slide, um, on the next one, uh, I, I will explain you a little bit uh, the new guidelines. Now, what is the scope, the, the rationale of this revision and the intention of these new guidelines? So the, the two main uh, building blocks are first to try to enlarge the scope of, of the guidelines to cover all new areas and technologies that can contribute to the Green Deal. The previous guidelines were more uh, a list of different chapters per technology. Uh, here now we are uh, um, reviewing the guidelines and structuring them by objective uh, to be achieved. And those objectives should cover practically all the areas of the green transition. And at the same time, we are looking for a flexibilization of the rules of the provisions in particular, and you will see it in the next few slides, for those areas that really support the green transition. So what we called the, the real green investments. Obviously, we are making the guidelines broader, wider, and, and more flexible. So we're talking about a state aid, and there is a, a, a responsibility by the Commission to make sure that a state aid does not distort competition. So it's important to have some safeguards uh, to make sure that the aid is really directed where it is needed to, to achieve the environmental protection and that there is no uh, greenwashing. Also, which is limited, uh, that is limited to, to the minimum necessary to, to achieve those goals. So that is uh, cost efficient, proportionate, because let's be honest, there is a limited budget everywhere in all member states. Uh, and therefore, uh, in order to achieve uh, all the targets of the Green Deal, that money has to be well, well used, well spent. And finally, as I said, these are competition rules, and therefore uh, we have to make sure that those investments that support does not unduly distort uh, competition or, or the integrity of the internal market. At the same time, the revision also tries to align the rules fully, uh, not only with the legislation existing and also the proposals uh, under the Fit for 55 package, but also with the policies of, of the Commission in, in these fields, now in the environmental and energy fields. So in the next slide, you can see that, um, as I said, these guidelines are an evolution because we, we need them to be fully up to the challenge, but also future proof because uh, this transition is going to last uh, quite a few years. So they have to, to reflect these uh, more ambitious policies of the Commission and they really have to, to support the Korean transition. And in this respect, uh, and I will explain in more detail, but just me, uh, flag first how uh, the guidelines are addressing the different type of, of investments. For those that we call green investments, so that's those that really support the Green Deal objectives and the green transition, as I say, we try to open and facilitate to the maximum uh, those side measures, uh, those that are fully compliant with the 2050 and 2030 targets. Then we have what we call the grey measures, 
and here we are mainly talking about gas investments. Here we recognize that uh, gas has an important role to play in the green transition and in particular in some member states where they come from a very fossil fuel based uh, capacity mix uh, or industry mix and obviously transition is needed and gas is important but we will scrutinize investments in, in in gas very closely because we have to make sure again that they are fully compliant with the 2030 2050 targets and we have to make sure that they do not displace other green air alternatives or that they do not produce a lock-in or, or create a, a stranded assets and finally uh, as a committed in the Green Deal communication and also in the sustainable, uh, sustainable Europe investment plan communication. Uh, the revision of the guidelines aims at phasing out subsidies and support to the most polluting fossil fuels. And that's why uh, we would be very strict and uh, I will explain more detail now. Brown measures, so those related to the most polluting fossil fuels uh, will not be allowed under the new guidelines in line with this commitment of facing out the support to, to, to the most polluting fossil fuels. In the next slide, you can see how we try to facilitate what I said, the, the green measures, not the real green measures that contribute to the, uh, to the green transition. First, as I mentioned, we want to enlarge the scope of the guidelines. We cover new areas or we cover them in more detail as they were not done in, in, in the previous guidelines. We look at industry decarbonization, but clean mobility uh, infrastructure, for example, is a completely new chapter. We're developing resource efficiency, including a chapter on biodiversity. Um, so as I say, it's not only about decarbonization or renewables anymore. It's about all the areas that affect uh, the Green Deal. Uh, as I said, also, we do not look at technologies one by one anymore. We look at those objectives and therefore support will be allowed to all those technologies, uh, current or future ones, uh, that can deliver those objectives. Second point, as I say, we are flexibilizing uh, the compatibility rules. We are allowing higher aid amounts. We are departing from the maximum aid intensities approach that we had seen uh, in the previous guidelines. And we are now allowing uh, member states to support up to 100% of the funding gap of an investment. And also we are allowing new type of aid instruments, like for example, contract carbon for differences. We will look at a simplified assessment of those measures that follow different objectives. But we are seeing that the, the line of the border uh, between the objectives in some measures sometimes is, is not very clear, is, is gray. So we are uh, we want to aim uh, for a, a easier assessment of those lines that follow different objectives. And as I said in the previous guidelines, they were very compartmentalized in different chapters by, by technology and sometimes that assessment was more more difficult uh, and finally also in order to facilitate these type of measures we are taking away that requirement that we had uh, before that was the individual notification of uh, some support measures already covered by approved schemes uh, but th that were over uh, a certain size now we are taking that away if there is a scheme that approves them, there is no need for individual notification uh, um, to, for those individual measures unless the schemes uh, said so. Finally, and uh, just to mention it here, uh, on the security of supply area, you know we had developed a significant case practice in the last few years in capacity mechanisms. Um, electricity regulation already brought into the the field, the new restrictions on emissions, on emissions, the emissions performance limit um, for power plants to participate in those mechanisms. We are allowing member states to be stricter if they want, so they could impose even stricter emission limits into the capacity participation on those mechanisms. And we also will allow them to be more generous uh, in terms of length of contracts when uh, we are talking about greener uh, technologies. And finally, and I will develop this a little bit more in, in a slide later, uh, GBER, as Catherine explained, or I think Juliet in the introduction as well, uh, sometimes there are measures uh, that member states uh, want to implement uh, that are covered by the general block exemption regulation, and therefore they do not have to be notified to the Commission for assessment. 
uh, we have included new articles and we are increasing the, the thresholds and, and the eight intensities there in the section seven, which is the one related to environmental protection. As I mentioned, on the other side of the balance, it's important also to introduce some safeguards, uh, for example, in the uh, decarbonization chapter or the greenhouse gas emissions chapter, we are introducing a provision for a requirement to do a public consultation. So to do a more inclusive process uh, in the design of the measures, consulting stakeholders, and also a quantification of the CO2 abatement cost, because at the end we want to see that these measures and the aid provided really contributes uh, to the green transition in a cost effective manner. In the next slide, we can see the details about gray and brown measures that I mentioned before. As I said, gray measures, we're talking mainly about gas. So um, when there are gas investments that member states want to do. We will have a closer scrutiny, as I say, to avoid the locking effects or displacement of greener technologies that are already available uh, or uh, the creation of a stranded cost. Now, so for example, you can see there when um, investing in gas infrastructure, uh, that infrastructure will have to be already uh, hydrogen ready or uh, in, in support for gas vehicles and refueling infrastructure uh, that will be possible provided that there are not already cleaner alternatives available in the market. Facing out of brown measures, here we have to be careful on the way we draft this because uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the Hinkley point uh, judgment that came, I think it was earlier this year, uh, in which the, the European Court of Justice told us that when assessing measures, uh, we cannot really do blacklist of activities. The Commission cannot do an example blacklist and prohibit certain activities if they contribute to the development of an economic activity. But we can take in our assessment in the balancing test where we take into account the positive aspects of a measure and the negative aspects normally in competition and trade but here uh, we are talking about also uh, negative externalities that these measures will create to the society and therefore when putting those negative externalities on the other side of the balance is very unlikely that the positive uh, effects of those investments in the most polluting fossil fuels will outweigh those negative effects. And therefore, it's very unlikely that those measures will be able to be approved under uh, the guidelines. Uh, and as I say, we have to be careful there on the way we do it because the court does not allow us to do a ex ante uh, blacklisting. So uh, in the next slide, as I uh, mentioned, the GBER, it's an important area for, for investments uh, in green transition. We have done, uh, as you know, there is a parallel revision of the GBER uh, together with the guidelines. As I said, the guidelines should be adopted before the end of this year. The GBER being a regulation uh, has a more cumbersome procedure, so it will be adopted. Um, it's planned now to be adopted by mid next year, the, the revision, but here, the document is already out for public consultation, is currently ongoing. And here we are proposing an horizontal enlargement. So with uh, wider and newer possibilities to be exempted under this regulation, as you can see there are new provisions, for example, in clean vehicles, uh, recharging infrastructure, and then also a vertical enlargement. We are proposing an increase in the notification thresholds uh, for projects to be under the GBER and also we are increasing uh, in some areas the maximum aid intensities up to 100% when the aid is granted via competitive bidding but we are also introducing green bonuses uh, in some areas like energy performance in buildings and also in district heating and, and cooling. And to finalize my, my presentation and leave time for, for the questions of, of the audience uh, in the next slide um, I wanted to show to you why these guidelines are important uh, for the just transition fund uh, and for the just transition because in article 8 of the regulation you have all the possibilities for investments under the just transition fund here i just picked a few which are those that may be eventually covered by these rules by the SEAG and by the section 7 of the GBER. as you can see all investments in, in infrastructures uh, about clean energy storage technologies or greenhouse gas emission reduction, which is, as I say, a key chapter of, 
for one new guidelines. All investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency, uh, all investments on clean mobility uh, and infrastructure, recharging infrastructure, all investments related to district heating uh, networks, in particular for the upgrade uh, and to make them energy efficient and, and cleaner. Um, all the investments related to um, natural habitats, uh, biodiversity, land restoration, and so on are also covered by this Article 8. Uh, and finally, investments related to, to circular economy, uh, waste uh, treatment, resource efficiency. Again, are those um, investments that would be eventually covered by these guidelines or by the Section 7 of, of the GBER. So that's why today we, we thought it was a good idea to, to make a presentation to you on, on, this, uh, on these guidelines. And that's all for my presentation. Uh, now ready to do the questions and give the floor back to Juliette. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, one question, as Catherine was mentioning, that for regional aid guidelines, there are specific rules and bonuses for just transition uh, projects. Why did the Commission decide, uh, even though it's still a draft, but why is the Commission thinking not to have specific rules for just transition regions in the SEAC? Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for that question. First, in the SEAC, there is one point is that uh, in the areas where we used to have um, the approach of calculating the aid based on, on maximum aid intensities, as I have mentioned, we are departing now from that approach. We're going to funding gap uh, calculation and support on the basis of, of funding gap. So, and, and, and we would allow member states to support up to 100%. Of handing gap. So therefore to add in specific bonuses uh, for specific areas, either uh, assisted areas, AC or areas under the just transition, um, would not make sense because it would imply, I mean, we cannot go above 100% that will imply overcompensation and overcompensation is not allowed by, by state aid rules. Also, um, it's true that in 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 some areas and, and, and very particular, but also in the GBER, uh, as you know, GBER, it's the member state automatically, let's say, applying the, the provisions. So those those rules normally tend to be uh, a little bit simpler. So we keep there um, the approach of maximum aid intensities. Uh, and here again, we are not considering, at least in, in our area in Section 7, additional bonuses uh, for uh, A regions or C regions or, or for um, just transition areas. Uh, and, and the reason is that while this is still justified for certain sectors of the economy, we believe it's no longer needed for investments in, in energy and environmental measures. First, because to reach the, the union uh, targets in terms of renewables, energy efficiency, um, and in general to reach all the Green Deal objectives, the member states will have to support investments in the entirety of their territory. Uh, uh, so there is no need to attract those investments to, to a specific areas. And second, um, the main driving element, uh, in particular in renewables, is whether um, the location of the project is suitable from a technical perspective. Uh, and this is, as I said, for example, the, the case of renewables installation or even energy infrastructures. So they, they will be located in those areas where electricity production can be maximized, um, regardless whether they are in A or, or C regions or, um, or in uh, just transition areas. That's that's the reason why in, in the guidelines and, and in the GBER section for environmental protection, we do not have a specific rules or, or provisions for, for these uh, specific regions. Thank you. Um, maybe one general question, somebody's in your, in your audience ask if you can explain or re-explain how the regional aid uh, and the SEA can be combined, articulated, when implementing the Just Transition Fund. When do we know under which guidelines we fall uh, and what are the rules that are going to be used in the Commission for financing a project? Well, there, if I may. Um, so, first of all, it's it's the um, well, it's always a responsibility of the member state to um, assess whether some type of support is aid or not aid. So, 
does it fall under state aid rules? Um, then the next step, if it falls under state aid rules, is to see how the aid can be uh, compatible. As I said, both, uh, so as at most of the aid is uh, implemented under the general block exemption regulation. So there again, it would be for the member state um, to, to assess, okay, how, how this aid can, can fit um, within the rules. Um, and it's only afterwards. So if it could not be um, considered compatible with the general block exemption regulation, that such aid uh, would have to be to be notified. And then it's really um, well case by case to be to be seen. Um, what is the project about? Um, how does it fit with the regional aid guidelines? How could it fit um, with the SEAC? Or is it to 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 be is part? Does it partly fit under the SEAC? Does it partly fit under the guidelines? So all of this is really a case by case um, assessment in that uh, in that sense. Thank you. Um, Alejandro, do you want to add anything? No, if if I'm not wrong, Catherine can can correct me. Uh, investments in energy are not uh, really covered by 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 the by the regional guidelines. So that's an area that goes practically automatically and under the SEAC. Uh, and the others that may be a little bit more borderline, uh, as Catherine uh, was saying, uh, member state needs to to come to us and and tell us what what support uh, they are aiming for. And then we see which uh, uh, rules better cover that. Thank you. Um, we have a question, uh, two questions actually, on uh, the future of the regions and in relation to gas, um, it, which is uh, seen sometimes as, as part of the, the decarbonization and transition. Um, one question is whether the state aid in the different just transition fund regions, the ones that are eligible to the just transition fund, should be uh, always given in coherence with the just transition fund and its scope and the just territory and the territorial just transition plan to avoid risking to fund projects which would jeopardize in the terms of the question the energy transition, for example, post gas projects. Sander, if you would like to reply, thank you. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So uh, thank you for the question. So in addition to what the colleagues from, from DigiComp have already explained, I would say that, of course, in first instance, the, the source of the funding defines the scope of what can be supported. So um, if investments in these regions are to be funded from the Just Transition Fund, so the first pillar of the Just Transition Mechanism, I mean, it, it is uh, super clear that uh, there is no possible support to any fossil fuels, so that's very clear. Uh, and obviously everything that is funded needs to be in line and contribute to the Territorial Just Transition Plans. When it comes to the second and third pillar of the Just Transition Mechanism, these of course have their own uh, legal basis, so the InvestEU regulation for the second pillar and the public sector loan facility regulation for the third pillar, uh, which need to be looked at um, for eligibility, but also uh, anything funded from these two uh, need to be in line with the territorial just transition plans. This is why we are always saying, and, and we, we said it again yesterday, that the plans are so important uh, um, to prepare the, the full scale of the just transition mechanism. However, if the, if the source of the funding is not I mean, if it's national funding or, or anything else, then of course, you know, these, these specific rules do not apply and, and it's the responsibility of the member state to make sure that investments in areas uh, are, are consistent. Thank you very much. Um, we have questions as well. Um, maybe a technical question in regards to regional aid. So in relation to stated for large enterprises, um, can you please carry for, clarify, maybe Catherine or, or, or one of you, whether the maximum aid intensity, which is allowed for large enterprises, is calculated per project or per entity? Yes, we look at it on a, on a project uh, basis. So we typically, um, so the concept we use in the guidelines is initial investment uh, project. So we would look at it project per project. However, um, so to, to avoid, of course, that um, project. So I said there is a scaling down mechanism. So the larger 
um, the, the project or the at large the investment is the, the, the lower the relative aid intensity becomes because it's it's uh, so we, we don't only take so for the for the highest part of the investment we only take into account about one third of the uh, of the investment amount so to avoid that um, projects are artificially split to escape this scaling down mechanism we also have the concept which is called single investment project so if different investment projects are done by the same company in a in a certain time frame in the same uh, area then we would look at them uh, together so but in principle it's by project Thank you. Um, one um, additional question in relation to gas um, that came up as well in the chat. How do you see that state aid to gas projects, if they are to be financed under the stated guidelines, comply with the 2030 and 2050 climate targets we have in the European Union? So thanks a lot, Juliet. As, as I explained a little bit in, in the presentation, uh, we what we call the grey measures, uh, we will devote a, a closer scrutiny and, and conditions uh, in order to, to approve these, uh, these type of measures, because indeed we have to, to make sure that they do not go against the 2030 and 2050 targets. But I think it's clear that the Commission has acknowledged that gas needs to play uh, a transition role and in particular in those member states as I mentioned at, at the beginning that are more reliant nowadays on, on the most polluting fossil fuels. Therefore I, I can give a, a few examples I already mentioned before for example infrastructure yes uh, there can be an investment in a gas infrastructure uh, provided that it's hydrogen ready and that in the future will be used uh, to uh, to will be ready to be used for the transport of hydrogen, for example. No, and even uh, there is uh, one one point in in there where we mentioned the possibility to for member states to present commitments in terms of of that. No, and and to commit themselves to start using high levels or percentages of uh, hydrogen in those uh, networks from certain uh, point in time. Again, for example, um, CCGT, a combined cycle gas turbine investment, you can uh, think about a, a power plant that needs to be put in place and that under the current electricity regulation, by the way, is allowed to participate uh, in, in a capacity mechanism, so uh, uh, could be could be granted. Uh, but again, they will have to show that from certain year they might be able, for example, to use hydrogen uh, for that uh, power plant or maybe to show that uh, by 2050 that plant would be fully amortized. Therefore, would, there would be no, no stranded asset and potentially a commitment to, to close it if it's fully amortized. So these are the types of uh, checks that we will have to, to develop on, on a case by case basis. It's true that the draft of the current SEAG is not very, very specific uh, because there are many possibilities. It's not very specific and detailed on how you can prove compliance with 2030, 2050. We hope to introduce some indications, a bit more details on, on the revised draft or on the final version that will be adopted um, before the end of the year. But then also it will be a, a matter of, of uh, case by case assessment. In particular, uh, this case by case assessment is, is mentioned, I think, in the district heating uh, chapter, uh, where it's an area that really, uh, in order to, to achieve, for example, the 2030 targets, I mean, if you have a, a, a a coal based uh, heating network, suddenly you cannot completely go away from it and, and change it. You might need to transit uh, through gas uh, and then uh, you can even think on abatement possibilities in the future, no? Um, because uh, if uh, as a, another possibility is to to commit or to guarantee that uh, from certain point those gas facilities, if they are producing facilities, uh, they will be uh, abated, no? They will invest in CCS, CCU, uh, this type of, of possibilities. 
Thank you. Um, as we are speaking about the transition um, away from fossil fuels, um, Article uh, 9 and 8 of the Just Transition Regulation exclude that to use the Just Transition Fund for financing uh, fossil fuel projects for production, commissioning, transport. Um, but they don't expl explicitly exclude the decommissioning of those facilities. Can we use the Just Transition Funds to finance uh, coal phase out? Um, and to give state aid for the phase out of coal plants under the chapter in the SEAG? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so indeed, Article 9 has a couple of exclusions from the JTF scope of support, whereas Article 8 uh, defines what can be supported. And uh, for people familiar with cohesion policy, um, it is a little bit um, different than what we had uh, before with the funds uh, like the European Regional Development Fund and the Cohesion Fund where we did not have a, a defined list of what can be supported, but for the Just Transition Fund we have. And so, um, of course, the Just Transition Fund uh, was created um, specifically to deal, among others, with uh, the coal phase out and is there really to help regions deal with the impacts of such a phase out and this means and and this is also reflected in the activities that can be supported that um, as priority investments uh, in in such regions um, the jtf should be used for uh, reskilling the people uh, investing in economic diversification uh, to give these uh, territories a new uh, economic future uh, and also to uh, rehabilitate the sites for instance the former coal mines or the former um, power uh, coal power plants um, and then there are of course a couple of other investments that could be uh, funded also if it's in line with with the plan so the question is really what are they really or, or what do you really want to fund I mean the the closing or the decommissioning as such uh, is not an activity uh, that can be uh, supported by the JTF it's rather the economic and social impacts of that operation that should be funded by the JTF Thank you. Um, Catherine Alejandro, would you like to add anything on this? On my side, I can say that in the SEAC there is a chapter uh, for, for the commissioning of coal uh, facilities. Obviously, if the fund money cannot be used for a specific, I mean, it's divided into the chapter. No, the, far, the first one is really for the closing of, of, of the mines and and or, or the generation uh, power plants coal base and it's for compensation of foregone profits so an early closure of those uh, power plants and it's really a compensation of, of foregone profits my understanding from what sander explained is that the, the money of the just transition fund cannot be used for that but there is a, a second chapter uh, within that let's say section which is the a4 exceptional cost that is uh, related to social and environmental costs uh, related to the closure of uh, of those uh, power plants or mining operations no and it's uh, exceptional cost to mitigate the social and regional consequences and therefore my understanding probably is that those for that second part of, of this chapter, probably the, the fund the just transition plan will be possible to to use. Um, Important also uh, to mention or, or to clarify that it was as it was done already in the SEAP communication is that when we are talking to support directed to the benefit of, of the individuals, uh, then uh, for social aid or, or reskilling, uh, many times that probably will not fall under stated rules uh, because uh, we will not be talking about uh, undertakings but just about the individuals. So we can expect, for example, that DG competition when assessing uh, a state aid for a coal phase out, let's say, would ask the member state to identify the source of the fund. Is it coming from the Just Transition Fund or is it coming from other national envelopes? No, not really, because it's not for, for us in the state of decision to, to, to check 
that uh, the member states are using this, the money from the just transition fund in, in the right manner. For us, the moment it gets into the state budget is stated money. I think it's our, for our colleague here, we, we pass the responsibility for, for our colleagues in, in Rio to make sure that the, the money from the fund is used according to the uh, just transition fund regulation. What we look is that the the money that comes from the state and issues and, and investment is compatible with the uh, stated rules. Obviously, uh, in the adoption process of a decision, it's a collegial decision by, by the Commission. It's not DGCOM, it's, it's the Commission and all uh, services and, and DGs are involved. And obviously our colleagues from, from Rio will tell us uh, if there's something wrong in the use of those funds because, again, going back to, to the Hinkley Point uh, judgment, when assessing uh, estate aid, we cannot or the Commission cannot approve aid that goes against EU legislation. Uh, that does not mean that in a state decision we have to check every single and one provision of all the EU <laughs> legislation, which would be impossible, no? But we have our colleagues in, in the different services to flag to us if there is something that is obviously clear and against uh, EU legislation in, in that specific measure. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of the session. I hope you find it very informative and, and fruitful. Thank you very much to our speakers uh, from DG Competition and DG Regio. Um, and I wish you a good uh, rest of the day at the conference. Thank you very much. Have a good day.